This is the truth of the matter, gentlemen of the jury. Wherever a man has taken a position that he believes to be best, or has been placed by his commander, there he must, I think, remain and face danger, without a thought for death or anything else rather than disgrace. Those are the words of Socrates. I decided we couldn't just leave him accused as we did last week. We read The Clouds together, talking about Aristophanes' accusation against Socrates, lumping him in with the sophists and the relativists and the natural philosophers um, and all of the dark, pernicious things that Aristophanes said those, you know, eggheads were doing. And I mentioned, I read a little bit of Socrates' apology, his speech before the jury in defense of himself. In 399 BC, he was called to trial and sentenced to death, but Plato writes this beautiful, probably semi-imagined, but incredibly articulate defense of Socrates against the accusations not only of the Athenian citizenry, he has three official accusers, Anatus, Miletus, and Lycon, but as we'll get into in a second, he's also defending himself against Aristophanes, against the court of public opinion, against all the rumors and whispering that have been going on in the background during his whole life. And it's a great time to be reading the Apology because it turns out that it is the manifesto for life in a time or a period um, when when free speech is under assault. Uh, Socrates defends himself here um, by saying essentially that when you expose the foolishness of the rich and powerful, they try to shut you down by just making any accusation against you that they can plausibly grab from out of thin air. They lumped him in, he says, with all the other sophists because he showed that they didn't know as much as they claimed. The poets, that is the artists, the technicians, that is the makers of things, or we might today say the scientists, and the politicians. He exposed them all, showed they had no clothes, showed that the emperor had no clothes, and exposed them for frauds. This does not make people happy. And we may think today about the kinds of things that people say, for example, about the accusers of Dr. Fauci. I'm going to get into this a little bit, but when you start to raise questions like, hmm, perhaps, you know, there was some sort of lab leak in Wuhan, um, then you start hearing accusations like, this is dangerous misinformation, right? And and what Socrates says here is essentially that the, the peddlers of misinformation are the great accusers of others of peddling misinformation. So all the people that are constantly saying, oh, danger, Joe Rogan, dangerous misinformation, you know, Ron Paul, dangerous. Um, those are the people who are themselves invested in a certain kind of self-image of themselves as wise authorities. Socrates' whole life was sort of involved in puncturing that pretense of wisdom. And today we too are involved in a kind of effort to puncture the false authority that people accrue to themselves on the basis essentially of nothing other than their pure will to power. So just to remind you the circumstances of this particular text, right, what was happening in Socrates' day, because it was not the same, obviously, as what we're facing today, Socrates had been accused of two things officially. One was corrupting the youth, and the other was disbelief in the gods of the city. We're going to get into what those two things mean, but we should also mention what we've said before, which is that he was also suspected of having in some way collaborated with the 30 tyrants. Athens lost the Peloponnesian War to Sparta in 404 BC. Sparta installed a kind of puppet government and oligarchy called the 30 tyrants, which meant that many pro-democratic supporters, supporters of Athens' democracy um, had to flee. They, some of them fled to Thebes. They fled to Boeotia. Um, and eventually, when they came back and overturned the 30, when the 30 were, were sent out, others were suspected of having stayed in the city to collaborate, including Socrates. The 30 was a brutal regime. Um, they executed and, and hauled into prison all sorts of people that were suspected of having pro-democratic sentiments, but they didn't execute Socrates. And so one of Socrates' jobs here is to kind of disassociate himself from power-hungry advisors and philosophers who had encouraged uh, you know, the ambitions of, of young men. Socrates was always talking to young men and in fact kind of shaping their ambitions and teaching them about virtue. Um, but some of his students ended up in the 30. And so he's trying essentially to distance himself from that to establish something like democratic bona fides um, while he also 
accuses his accusers, basically, of, of being the ones who are really corrupting the youth um, and and defends himself as, as not an atheist, which is another interesting dimension of it we're going to get into. Um, but fundamentally, right, we're reading this both because we want to give Socrates his due after having uh, slandered him via Aristophanes last week and because we too live in a world where the, the man who questions the man who um, who accuses the authorities of being unwise um, or, or who exposes the unwisdom of the authorities is liable to find himself in a heap of hot water as well. Do you ever just get frustrated that photographs, we take all of these photographs in the digital age and then they just disappear or like get stuck on our phones. Paint Your Life is the perfect solution to that. They will take a cherished photograph of any kind, anything that you really want to remember, um, maybe somebody that is no longer with you, somebody that you love very dearly, a memory from a trip that you took, anything at all. Um, and they, when you send in your photograph to them, they will give it to a professional artist. You'll get to work with them uh, and make sure that the result is something that you like. Um, and they will paint it by hand. You can get this portrait in as little as two weeks. Um, and these are things that you can cherish forever. They're great to give as gifts or just to get for yourself. Um, and, you know, I, I really think you're going to love it. If you don't love the final painting, your money will be refunded, guaranteed. There's no risk. For a limited time, you can get this awesome offer just from people that listen to Young Heretics. You'll get 20% off your painting and free shipping uh, when you text the word heretics, H-E-R-E-T-I-C-S, to 64,000. So that's text the word heretics to the number 64,000. And it's a limited time offer, so check it out now. 20% off plus free shipping when you text heretics to 64,000. Paint your life. Celebrate the moments that matter most. Terms apply. They are available at paintyourlife.com forward slash terms. One more time, text heretics to 64,000. I think you're going to love it. So we're going to begin at the beginning. The speech has kind of three parts. At the beginning, Socrates himself lays out the charges against him and defends himself. Then he interrogates one of his accusers, Miletus, who is the only one that gets to speak in this text. He's kind of in a dialogue with Socrates, completely rips Miletus' argument to shreds. Um, but then the jury nevertheless uh, finds him guilty and condemns him to death. And so he has one final chance to uh, speak his his piece before going off to prison and dying. It is a wonderful text for thinking about a question that I often get asked on locals or just from other people who listen to this show. Uh, people ask, you know, when is the right time to risk it all, to lay it on the line? I feel like if I stand up against this vaccine mandate, I might lose my job. You don't have to worry about that anymore because the Daily Wire uh, won their court case against the vaccine mandate. But that was a question that a lot of people were asking. And there are still all sorts of things you can risk by speaking up, let's say, against, you know, what's called DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion training, um, which is really a kind of indoctrination into this, you know, radical new uh, racial hierarchy, right? Um, when you speak up against that, you're liable to be accused of all sorts of nasty things. Um, you might lose your job, you might get bad grades, anything that you're risking, right, which are which is real, and people have families to think about and futures to consider. And so Socrates is essentially saying here, this is the thing for which I will stand and die even though if I survived, I could go on and live, you know, a longer life. He's over 70 years old when he makes this defense. He says, I am ready to die for this. That is for seeking the truth, for, for asking questions and for um, insisting on satisfactory answers or at least not accepting unsatisfactory answers. For that alone, I will die. And one of the things that I've been stressing a lot is that even if there are some things that you can compromise on, maybe, in fact, you know, the vaccine is not the thing that you really feel like you need to die on that hill. Um, but there must be something, right? You need to ask yourself, what is the thing um, that I will not give up no matter what is taken away from me? Uh, for for me, for other people, I hope it is faith, right? It is, it is belief in, in Jesus Christ. We have seen people die for that throughout the ages. There are people dying for it still in, in countries that are not America. And, you know, we hope that we will stand for that here if it ever comes to that, right? Once you know what that thing is, then you can negotiate other compromises in the knowledge that there is a line past which you will not go. So that is something that Socrates essentially establishes here. He says, this is the thing I would, I would not have courage. I would not have that Andrea, which we talked about about from the Republic, right? I would not have that thing that, that locks 
something into place and all my virtue would be worth nothing if I if I couldn't stand up against any threat in defense of it. So that's a, you know, kind of the the heart of this speech. Uh, but it begins with this very eloquent and sort of sly um, introduction. He kind of gets his way into it using this trope um, that we have in a lot of Athenian speeches where he basically says, you know, I, I don't have any skill, skill at rhetoric. I'm, I'm no good at um, making fancy arguments. I just have the truth. All that I can do is the truth. Now, of course, that is a very effective rhetorical ploy in and of itself, but it's also meant to defend Socrates against this accusation that all he's interested in is, is fancy arguments and rhetoric, like we talked about last week, right? He says the other sophists believe in that. I don't. I'm actually here to try to get to what is true, and I will die for it. So here he goes. He says, I do not know, men of Athens, how my accusers affected you. As for me, I was almost carried away in spite of myself. So persuasively did they speak. It's a very famous opening where to imagine that his accusers have just given their speech, uh, their accusation. And he says, I, was, I almost believed that I was guilty, even though he says, and yet hardly anything of what they said is true. Of the many lies they told, one in particular surprised me, namely that you should be careful not to be deceived by an accomplished speaker like me, that they were not ashamed to be immediately proved wrong by the facts when I show myself not to be an accomplished speaker at all, that, I thought, was most shameless on their part, unless, indeed, they call an accomplished speaker the man who speaks the truth. If they mean that, I would agree that I am an orator, but not after their manner, for, indeed, as I say, practically nothing they said was true. From me, you will hear the whole truth, though not by Zeus gentlemen, expressed in embroidered and stylized phrases like theirs, but things spoken at random and expressed in the first words that come to mind, for I put my trust in the justice of what I say, and let none of you expect anything else. It would not be fitting at my age, as it might be for a young man, to toy with words when I appear before you. It's an incredibly imposing introduction. You must imagine that this figure of Socrates would have been a, a stunning one, even for those who were ready to accuse him, who were caught up in the mob against him, who had believed the lies about him. Um, when, he, when he stood up there and, and said these kinds of words, I'm sure it struck a chill into the hearts of those who heard, there is a passage in Aristotle's Rhetoric, a text that we haven't yet covered but will at some point on this show, in which he says, the art of rhetoric is in itself a kind of truth neutral art. That is, you can you can apply good rhetoric to false and true arguments. We know this. This is something we've talked about before, making the weaker argument the stronger, which was the kind of Protagoras thing. Now, of course, we have the same idea in the Apology. But, says Aristotle, you have to do more work, essentially, if your argument is false. So it's not that rhetoric itself is inherently uh, the science of truth. It's the science of persuasion. But pers truth conforms itself more readily to persuasion than lies. And so Socrates is, is genuinely saying that here. He's saying, all I'm going to do is present to you the truth as directly as possible. And that is a kind of eloquence. That is, But it's the opposite kind of eloquence from my accusers who are liars and therefore have to rely on this elaborate kind of oratorical fireworks display, right? Have to set off all of these fancy phrases against me. And he says, this is... Another thing that I think we could really stand to listen to and, and contemplate today, right? He says, I'm not just going up against my literal accusers. I'm going up against all the people who have conditioned you to think of me as a scoundrel. Uh, all the people who have made plays about me, right? People like Aristophanes, um, all the people who have whispered about me, who have sort of lumped me in with a bunch of other people whose project is different from mine, right? All the sophists, the Protagoras, the Prodicuses, the Gorgiases, all the guys that Plato spent his whole career trying to separate Socrates from, they have now been kind of associated in one big lump by this whispering campaign, by, by public opinion. So here he's, here he's what he says. He says, it is right for me, gentlemen, to defend myself first against the first lying accusations made against me and my first accusers, and then against the later accusations and the later accusers. There have been many who have accused me to you for many years now, and none of their accusations are true. These I fear much more than I fear Anatus and his friends. Remember, those are the three official accusers. I fear them much more than Anatus, though they too are formidable. These earlier ones, however, are more so, gentlemen. They got hold of most of you from childhood, persuaded you, 
and accused me quite falsely, saying that there is a man called Socrates, a wise man, a student of all things in the sky and below the earth, who makes the worse argument the stronger. Those who spread that rumor, gentlemen, are my dangerous accusers, for their hearers believe that those who study these things do not even believe in the gods. Moreover, these accusers are numerous and have been at it a long time. Also, they spoke to you at an age when you would most readily believe them, some of you being children and adolescents, and they won their case by default, as there was no defense. I have said this before on this podcast, but why do you think one of the major political battles in the U.S. right now is over early childhood education, public schools, preschools, elementary schools. And why do you think that when we start talking about CRT and racial indoctrination, when we start talking about radical gender theory and gender bred people and all of this stuff that is being taught in our public schools on our dime, why do you think that we get accused of all the worst kinds of stuff? Why do we get called racists and misogynists and homophobes and everything? It's because the left understands that, or rather the radicals in our country understand that if you can get at people at a young age, you can condition them, right? People are impressionable. It's very, very difficult to argue against something that has been molded into your soul from youth, especially via artistic means. Remember when we talked about uh, Paralandra, C.S. Lewis's book about, you know, the kind of new Eve fighting against uh, Satan. Uh, Satan did a lot of whispering in Eve's ear while she was asleep, painting kind of artistic portraits, right? This cloud of associations that has accused Socrates in non-logical ways. So it's hard to make a logical argument against it because it's more of an emotion, more of a sort of sense or a zeitgeist or just a general atmosphere, right? Um, I've talked before also about kinds of philosophy that we believe without assenting to them intellectually. Epicureanism is, is one that I've mentioned, right? The idea that we're all just atoms bouncing into different configurations. If we think about that, we know it's not true. We know it doesn't make any sense. And yet we're still inclined to say things like, oh, I had an adrenaline rush, right? Um, there's a line in a John Mayer song, I'll wait until the next time we can go into another serotonin overflow, right? That way of talking about ourselves, like we're just bags of meat with chemistry sets inside, is not just something that people placed before you in logical argument, but they put it into pop songs, right? And you hear it kind of all around you. And so even if you disagree with it, you have this kind of instinct for it. The major person whom our atmospheric philosophy accuses today is God. God is the person who has been denigrated and denied and, and talked about as if he's somebody that only old-fashioned troglodytes believe in. Only cavemen believe in God. It's sky daddy, right? It's this medieval nonsense, right? This kind of cloud of association that we have with words that we don't even fully understand, like medieval, right? As if all medieval means is just dumb, right? I've talked about chronological chauvinism before, the idea that all these old ideas, we just have to sweep them out because they're, they're bad and evil. And we see this portrayed for us in art. We see it kind of depicted and we have it whispered around us. And we never really stop and think about, well, what is the actual argument against God? Just like Socrates' jury, Socrates, um, you know, the men of the jury are not thinking about what is the actual argument against Socrates. They're thinking more in terms of what's the kind of cultural atmosphere, or rather that cultural atmosphere is just seeping into their ears. Plato talks about music going in uh, to the soul through the ears like a funnel. Um, and it's that kind of thing here, right? One of the really remarkable things about this text is that Socrates is that kind of proto-Jesus figure. And I don't say that to suggest that he, you know, is on the same level as Jesus or whatever, but I've said a million times, right, that there are prefigurations of Jesus in classical literature, as of course there would be if Jesus is who he says he is, which is the ultimate kind of culmination of humanity, right? And so Socrates basically stands in here, as he says, for anybody that seeks the truth with fearless honesty, right? Anybody that, that seeks the truth will be lumped in with the truth and accused and slandered and lied about. Um, and so it, it's fitting in a way that the thing we currently have dismissed by this sort of campaign of public opinion most vociferously, that we get most angry angry about is God, because Socrates here, as he will go on to say, is a kind of servant of God. He's a kind of seeker after God who is truth. And he, he says again and again in this speech that those who seek after God, he will not be the first or the last to die for that. We might think also of the cave, right, in Plato's Republic, which we talked about, that the man who goes out of the cave sees the sun. When he comes back down and tries to bring people up, they tear him to shreds. They might even crucify him. So that's what this speech is about. And it's not just 
you know, it, Jesus is the culmination of that, but he's the culmination of it because it's what happens everywhere, at all places and in all times. Truth is under assault. Let's go on. Let's read more about Socrates' uh, accusations and the way he intends to rebut them. He says, what is most absurd in all this is that one cannot even know or mention the names of these accusers unless one of them is a writer of comedy. So he's saying Aristophanes is one, but there's plenty others. Those who maliciously and slanderously persuaded you, who also, when persuaded themselves, then persuaded others, all those are most difficult to deal with. One cannot bring one of them into court or refute him. One must simply fight with shadows, as it were, in making one's defense and cross-examine when no one answers. I want you to realize, too, that my accusers are of two kinds, those who have accused me recently and the old ones I mentioned, and to think that I must first defend myself against the latter. For you have also heard their accusations first, and to a much greater extent than the more recent. Very well, then, I must surely defend myself and attempt to uproot from your minds in so short a time the slander that has resided there so long. I'm reading here, by the way, from a collection by G.M.A. Grube, uh, who's a modern translator of Plato. His, um, he has a collection uh, with another scholar of, of all the works of Plato, which is really worth owning if you want to splurge on a great book. Um, but the thing that Socrates will now embark upon is probably one of the most famous things that, that Plato ever wrote, and that is his defense against the sort of general cloud of accusations by way of accusing his accusers. And I think he probably knows here that he's doomed, and certainly Plato, who's writing it, knows, of course, that he's doomed. And so in addition to being his self-defense, this is also his last stand and his manifesto against the kinds of people um, and the kinds of arrogance and self-regard that have led to this point. So let's read this, this famous story. It's time to talk about your soul, <laughs> not your S-O-U-L, but your S-O-L-E. I am thrilled and honored that soul is supporting young heretics. These guys are great. They make uh, orthotics, which is a fancy way of saying footbeds, um, to support your foot in whatever you're doing. If you live an active lifestyle, which you should, then you're going to be using your feet a lot. But even if you're just wandering around, right, 85% of the population will have one or more foot-related ailments in their lifetime. Uh, the footbed is where you rest your soul. It's affordable, customizable, and improves people's everyday foot comfort. Uh, sole is a great way to sort of support your foot. You don't even know uh, that you're causing problems until you use sole, and then you suddenly realize how much better it is. They also make flip-flops, which I really love. I wear them around the house all the time. Um, they're they're top-notch products. They're super affordable, and you can get 50% off your first purchase when you go to yoursoul.com forward slash heretics or use the promo code Heretics. It's an incredible deal. 50% off your first purchase. The stuff is already not super expensive, uh, but it will change your foot game for good. Yoursoul.com forward slash heretics. Anything that you do, run, walk, golf, lift, you got to check out Soul. Yoursoul.com forward slash heretics or use the code heretics at checkout for 50% off. So the famous story that Socrates now embarks upon is the story of how he discovered that he was the wisest man, uh, the wisest man in Athens, and perhaps indeed the wisest man in the world. Um, I won't spoil it for you. I'll just, I'll just start reading. He says, you know Chirophon. Chirophon was in Aristophanes, by the way. Um, he was my friend from youth, says Socrates, and the friend of most of you, as he shared your exile and your return. Very subtle here. When he says he shared your exile and your return, he's talking about the exile of, of the democratic faction. So he's subtly disassociating himself from the 30 and associating himself with those who suffered exile for their democratic sentiments. Um, you surely know the kind of man he was, how impulsive in any course of action. He went to Delphi at one time and ventured to ask the oracle. As I say, gentlemen, do not create a disturbance. Don't interrupt. You can hear and feel the energy of the mob right in this speech. Don't interrupt. He asked if any man was wiser than I. And the Pythian, that is the, the oracle, Apollo's oracle at Delphi, replied that no one was wiser. No one was wiser than Socrates. Chirophon is dead, but his brother will testify to you about this. Consider that I tell you this because I would inform you about the origin of the slander. When I heard of this reply, I asked myself, whatever does the god mean? What is his riddle? I am very conscious that I am not wise at all. What then does he mean by saying that I am the wisest? For surely he does not lie. It is not legitimate for him to do so. 
he's a god. He's showing, displaying his piety here too, right? It's, it's actually quite masterful the way that he lumps all of his different defenses into kind of a couple sentences. He's saying, I, the god can't lie. For a long time, I was at a loss as to his meaning. Then I very reluctantly turned to some in, such investigation as this. I went to one of those reputed wise thinking that there, if anywhere, I could refute the oracle and say to it, this man is wiser than I, but you said I was. Then when I examined this man, there is no need for me to tell you his name. He was one of our public men. My experience was something like this. So he goes to a politician, right? A famous demagogue. He says, I thought that he appeared wise to many people and especially to himself, but he was not. I then tried to show him that he thought himself wise, but that he was not. As a result, he came to dislike me, and so did many of the bystanders. This is kind of the feigned Socratic naivete, right? I was shocked to discover that people don't like it when you prove that they're idiots, right? But it's also a truism, right? If if you interrogate people who are, you know, who have a lot of self-regard, a lot of self-respect, just look at what happens when somebody questions or attacks Ibram X. Kendi or Nicole Hannah-Jones or Robin D'Angelo, these peddlers of anti-racism. What's the first thing they say? You're just, you know, responding with white fragility because you're a racist, right? They, they immediately lash out and accuse you because they're getting hundreds of thousands of dollars worth in, in speaking fees all the time um, for peddling this nonsense that the only remedy to past discrimination is future discrimination, this divisive, toxic nonsense that they're out there peddling, you know, and they're afforded this incredible clout and this incredible respect in their circles as if they were these grand, you know, the, the MacArthur Genius Grant goes to some of these people because there's, you know, they're so wise and they're, they're so respected. And the minute you expose the many obvious flaws in their argument, the first thing they'll do is attack you. And Socrates is observing this here as a truism, as a truth about what happens when you speak truth to cultural power. After that, he says, I proceeded systematically. I realized to my sorrow and alarm that I was getting unpopular, but I thought that I must attach the greatest importance to the God's Oracle. You have to love Socrates because he's such a pain in the ass, but he's also incredibly sly, right? He says, I, I was getting unpopular, shocked to discover even on death's door, he's making these jokes. But I thought that I must attach the greatest importance to the God's Oracle. So I must go to all those who had any reputation for knowledge to examine its meaning. And by the way, you know, people talk all the time, was the Socrates that Plato depicts the real Socrates is just a mouthpiece for Plato. There are certainly points at which both things are true. Sometimes Plato uses Socrates for his own opinions, especially as his career develops. It seems he kind of develops his own ideas. But the character of the man comes through so clearly. Plato was such a skilled prose stylist who's known for this in antiquity. And the kind of person that he was is, is printed onto these pages at, after, you know, 2,300 years, 2,400 years. It's, it's kind of remarkable. Uh, he says, you know, by the dog, gentlemen of the jury, for I must tell you the truth. I experienced something like this. In my investigation in the service of the God, I found that those who had the highest reputation were nearly the most deficient, while those who were thought to be inferior were more knowledgeable. I must give you an account of my journeyings as if they were labors I had undertaken to prove the oracle irrefutable. This is going to come back when he starts to defend his own right belief in gods. He says, after the politicians, I went to the poets, the writers of tragedies and dithyrams and the others, intending in their case to catch myself being more ignorant than they. So I took up these poems, which they seemed to have taken most trouble with, and asked them what they meant in order that I might at the same time learn something from them. I am ashamed to tell you the truth, gentlemen, but I must. Almost all the bystanders might have explained the poems better than their authors could. You're saying anybody could have been smarter about this poetry than the people that actually composed it, right? I soon realized that poets do not compose their poems with knowledge, but by some inborn talent and inspiration like seers and prophets, who also say many fine things without understanding of what they say. This is a central observation of a number of Platonic dialogues. We might think also of the Ion, and we shouldn't just think about poets in terms of like uh, Keats and Wordsworth and whoever, but this is a sort of stand-in, poiesis is a kind of stand-in for artistry, right? Making art. Um, artists have this cultural clout and authority because what they do is in fact very lovely and contains many true observations about the world. But Socrates says it's a kind of 
gift. It's a kind of channeling of a certain form of truth that then leads us to believe that they know and understand everything. You see this all the time, of course, at award shows, right? You go to the Oscars and Leo DiCaprio gets up and makes some thunderous speech about climate change. He doesn't know anything about climate change. He just plays a scientist in some movies, right? I mean, I'm not a doctor. I just play one on TV. That's a real thing. When you see somebody, you know, acting out in these noble and dignified ways, you think of this person as a noble and dignified person. But if there's one thing the Me Too era has taught us, of course, it's that Hollywood is full of scoundrels and rats and all kinds of crazy people. And there's no reason why we should imagine that they're wise simply because they play wise people on TV or they're handsome, they're attractive, right? There's this incredible power uh, that poets and artists have over us. But Socrates is saying, I basically found out that that's nonsense. At the same time, I saw that because of their poetry, they thought themselves very wise men in other respects. They thought they knew about other stuff which they were not. So there again, I withdrew, thinking that I had the same advantage over them as I had over the politicians. It's amazing. This text is like a resume of our of, of modern times when you look at it. And, and not because it's like, you know, oh, we're trying to shoehorn it into contemporary resonance, but because it's about these profound truths that endure in every age, right? So now I went to, finally, he says, I went to the craftsman. And this is a neglected part, I think, of this story. The craftsmen, right, those who practice a techne, um, are, are they're those who are able to do and accomplish great things, right? People who can make stuff, who can build things, um, people who have a, a skill at bringing about certain results. Um, but they don't always necessarily understand the principles, the underlying principles behind them, right? They can practice things, um, they can do great things, but they can't actually tell you the why of everything. I've been stressing for a while that this is the position in which our scientists find themselves, right? The scientists who know how the universe works mechanically, who can tell you miraculous things about the way that atoms work and indeed who can build things and make technological wonders that you hold in your hand and go, wow, how, how did this iPhone ever come to be? The person who made it must be very wise. But of course, knowing how to build and make things and understand the workings of things while it is a great gift is not the same thing as wisdom. It's not the same thing about knowing what is good. It's not the same thing as knowing about what we should do in political situations. And so our worship of, you know, Dr. Fauci and the CDC and the WHO is an example of confusing technological craftsmanship in the language of Socrates with wisdom. He says, I went to the craftsman for I was conscious of knowing practically nothing. And I knew that I would find that they had knowledge of many fine things. In this, I was not mistaken. They knew things I did not know. And to that extent, they were wiser than I, right? Physicists know more than I do about gravity and about the motion of planets and all that stuff that, you know, indeed uh, has applications here and now that do wondrous things, right? They had, in that extent, they are wiser than us. But gentlemen of the jury, the good craftsmen seem to me to have the same fault as the poets. Each of them, because of his success at his craft, thought himself very wise in most other important pursuits, and this error of theirs overshadowed the wisdom they had, so that I asked myself, on behalf of the oracle, whether I should prefer to be as I am with neither their wisdom nor their ignorance, or to have both. And this is the famous part that everybody takes away from this story, right? What Socrates realizes is that no man is wise. God alone is wise, but the man who knows he is not wise and therefore seeks constantly, yearns after truth and beauty and pursues it with a kind of erotic longing, that man, the man who knows he is not wise, is the wisest man because everybody else inflates himself with borrowed wisdom, it confuses technical skill or poetic competence or artistic gravitas, confuses those things with real wisdom and therefore makes himself a fool. This is exactly the situation in which we find ourselves in a million ways. We listen to poets, we listen to scientists, we listen to everybody except, except the people who come forward to simply ask questions, right? I mean, it's, it's absurd to be saying that Nicki Minaj is wiser than our politicians and our senators. And yet, remember when Nicki Minaj was like, I'm wondering about some questions about the vaccine. Now, that's not to say, of course, that Minaj was right that the vaccine will cause weird male reproductive problems. But it is to say that she then came out simply to say, you're allowed to ask questions and not, you know, there's things we don't know. And just for saying that she became, she was suddenly on the verge of cancellation, right? And that's kind of an amazing thing that, you know, this, this dumb, you know, speaking of singers, right, this dumb 
singer, uh, is, is able by admitting her ignorance to be wiser than all her colleagues in the arts and all the politicians and all the scientists who stand up there and declaim that they have the truth and anything other than that is dangerous misinformation. And Socrates, surely, if anybody is dangerous misinformation, it's Socrates. We all know that the education system is broken and the Albertus Magnus Institute is one of the best places to go to fix that problem. They run what's called the Magnus Fellowship. It's named after Albert the Great, their namesake, who is famous for writing about the true, the good, and the beautiful. On the highest good is his most famous work, and that's what they teach about here. They teach about the true, the good, and the beautiful. Any level that you may currently be at, this is a wonderful place to take your education further in a real way, seeking real wisdom and finding it with live online courses. They're interactive. You can enroll in spring courses now. The spring 2022 term begins on February 7th. You don't have that much time, and it's going to be great. They're doing courses in the epic literature of The Lord of the Rings and Kristen Lovren's Daughter, The Philosophy of Human Nature, The Philosophy of Being, only the good stuff. You can become a fellow today to find out how to receive early registration. And courses are limited to 25 fellows, so they will fill up quick. You want to check it out now at magnusinstitute.org forward slash heretics to sign up. you got to use that link because then you'll get a free gift when you sign up for the Magnus Fellowship. magnusinstitute.org forward slash heretics. Uh, free, live, and online interactive instruction on the true, the good, and the beautiful. What could be better? magnusinstitute.org forward slash heretics for a free gift when you sign up. So having defended himself against these kind of general accusations, these instinctive, intuitive accusations that come from plays and all that, Socrates then turns to the specific accusations against himself, which are that he is corrupting the youth and that he does not believe in the gods that the city believes in. And he brings Miletus forth to, forth to kind of question him on this. He says, for one thing, you, he shows that Miletus essentially does not care about the, the wisdom or the goodness of the people in the city, and that really what his concern is about is about establishing and maintaining relationships of power. And he, he interrogates him to say, you know, is it that you think I don't believe in any gods at all? Or is it that you think I don't believe in the gods of the city? And Melita says, you're, you're an atheist full stop. You just don't believe in God. Now, Socrates has already paved the way for his defense against this. But now is when he comes right out and says, you're just lumping me and you're just grabbing for any accusation that you can make because this is the kind of accusation that people generally make against philosophers, right? He says, you say that I believe in spiritual things and teach about them, whether new or old, but at any rate, spiritual things according to what you say. And to this, you have sworn in your deposition. That is, you say that I'm believing in other gods, quote unquote, than the city believes. And you then lump that in with somebody like Anaxagoras, for example, um, or other sophists whom you accuse of, of true atheism. But you say, what I'm doing actually is something else. And we get this in the Euthyphro. What I'm doing is I'm questioning the assumptions that people have. We saw this also in Republic Book 3, right? The assumptions that people have and feel comfortable with about the many gods of Athens. And he's saying, I actually have the highest possible respect, right, for divine truth. I, he, he says elsewhere that he thinks he has a kind of daimon that is a spirit which hovers over him and, and spurs him on to truth. And he's mentioned, of course, that he believes in, in prophecy or in this kind of divine utterance, um, which he seeks in the symposium and all sorts of other dialogues. He says, if I believe in spiritual things, I must quite inevitably believe in spirits. Is that not so? It is indeed. I shall assume that you agree, as you do not answer. Do we not believe spirits to be either gods or the children of gods? Yes or no? And Melita says, of course. Then, since I do believe in spirits, as you admit, if spirits are gods, this is what I mean when I say you speak in riddles and in jest, as you state that I do not believe in gods, and then again that I do since I do believe in spirits. If, on the other hand, the spirits are children of the gods, bastard children of the gods by nymphs or some other mothers, as they are said to be, what man would believe children of the gods to exist, but not gods? That would be just as absurd as to believe the young children of horses and asses, namely mules, to exist, but not to believe in the existence of horses and asses. You must have made this deposition, Miletus, either to test us or because you were at a loss to find any true wrongdoing of which to accuse me. There is no way in which you could persuade anyone of even small intelligence that it is possible for one and the same man to believe in spiritual but not also in divine things. And then again, for that same man to believe neither in spirits nor in gods, 
nor in Hira. So he's caught Miletus out in a million contradictions and inconsistencies here. But more important is the distinction he's making between not believing in gods at all, full stop, being an actual atheist. He's saying, I'm not an atheist. I believe very strongly in divine power. But what I don't assent to is just whatever the city says is true. Whatever the state tells me is true. And of course, this too is something of which people are often accused. Now, we don't talk in theological terms because we don't recognize ourselves as a spiritual and theological society. But of course, G.K. Chesterton told us, right, that America is a nation with the soul of a church. And even though we have, you know, publicly banished God from our, you know, courthouses and our schools and any publicly funded area, even though we have drastically misinterpreted the separation of church and state to mean that there is no, you know, there's no God anywhere in our, in our public life, right? Nevertheless, nature abhors a vacuum. And when you kick God out, something else takes its place. Bob Dylan says, you got to worship, you got to serve something, right? There's human beings worship things that are higher than themselves. And as Chesterton also reminds us, if you kick God out of that position, what you worship instead is power. And this is why you see people lighting prayer candles to Stacey Abrams and Dr. Fauci. This is why you see people kneeling and demanding that others kneel on the streets and in football stadiums, right? It's because we are developing a ritual and a theology of political power. And those who are currently seeking absolute political power, that is the defund the police crowd and all of the radicals that want to essentially abolish and overturn the American regime and American traditions, right? They are basically making a bid for power in a kind of theocracy. It doesn't go by that name, but that's what it is, right? We are being called to bend the knee to the city's gods. And Socrates is saying, when you defy, when you seek the real God, when you seek truth, and when you seek true divine inspiration, when you speak, seek reality, you are inherently defying the city's gods because the gods of power will always demand your allegiance over anything else. And so he is going down, essentially, with the ship of truth against what he knows to be a state that worships its own power. And so that is what he does. Socrates is convicted. We all know this. He is found guilty. He's sentenced to death. And there ensues his manifesto of going down with the ship. So that's what we're going to get to next. And that's what indeed we started with. You really should go away and read this whole dialogue. It's not that long. It's a great introductory text for, you know, citizenship, for philosophy, for the Western tradition. Generally, if you're looking for somewhere to start, this is a great place. There are good translations of it. There are even some free online. And I, I really do think you should go read, read this whole thing. And especially this last section is worth reading in its entirety. I read a portion of it at the beginning. I'm just going to choose one other portion to talk about. Uh, and then I will close out with a few other comments on our present state of affairs. Socrates says, why then do some people enjoy spending considerable time in my company? You have heard why, gentlemen of the jury. I have told you the whole truth. They enjoy hearing those questioned who think they are wise, but are not. And this is not unpleasant. To do this has, as I say, been enjoined upon me by the God, by means of oracles and dreams, and in every other way that a divine manifestation has ever ordered a man to do anything. This is true, gentlemen, and can easily be established. Now I want to prophesy to those who convicted me, for I am at the point when men prophesy most when they are about to die. I say, gentlemen, to those who voted to kill me, that vengeance will come upon you immediately after my death a vengeance much harder to bear than that which you took in killing me. You did this in the belief that you would avoid giving an account of your life, but I maintain that quite the opposite will happen to you. There will be more people to test you, whom I now held back, but you did not notice it. They will be more difficult to deal with, as they will be younger, and you will resent them more. You are wrong if you believe that by killing people, you will prevent anyone from reproaching you for not living in the right way. To escape such tests is neither possible nor good, but it is best and easiest not to discredit others, but to prepare oneself to be as good as possible. With this prophecy to you who convicted me, I part from you. The children who live under 
oppressive regimes, the children who watch the truth be silenced, remember. And you do not silence the truth by killing people. All you do is pave the way for more and worse conflicts, for greater struggle, right? This is something that we have seen time and again. What happened when they kicked Trump off of Twitter, right? Trump wasn't the point. There was, it, look, you know, Trump was, I believe, the right man for the right time. I'm not saying anything particularly for or against him here, only to say that they thought that they could ax the movement, the conservative movement, the new right, by kicking him off of Twitter. And whether you love the new right or hate it, that has manifestly not been true. Trump is now, uh, as of the latest Real Clear Politics average, he's something like five points ahead of Biden for 2024, right? This is a hydra. When you cut the head off of the truth rather than engaging it, rather than showing yourself to be calmly capable of engaging in real debate, right? When you make all this noise about misinformation and our hashtag our democracy and our truth, and then you silence or try to silence anybody who stands in your way, who pokes and questions, who reveals your frauds, who reveals your fakery. When that happens, you don't shut people up. You radicalize them. And Socrates is making here exactly the prediction that we might make to anybody who finds themselves tempted to try and simply shut down the opposition. On that note, I'm going to read to you now from a, an article in Variety about one Joe Rogan. Here's Variety. Joe Rogan, who hosts the most listened to podcast on Spotify, has become a public health menace by repeatedly promoting falsehoods about COVID on his show, according to a group of doctors and health professionals. I love that according to at the end, right? They leave to the end according to a group of doctors. But of course, the lead is he has become a public health menace according to a group of doctors and public health professionals. The experts, the experts are here to weigh in. More than 260 doctors, nurses, scientists, health professionals, and academics in a January 10th open letter to Spotify called on the streaming audio platform to, quote, implement a misinformation policy, specifically citing the Joe Rogan experience and its, quote, concerning history of broadcasting misinformation, particularly regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. The letter highlighted Rogan's December 31st episode in which his guest was discredited scientist Robert Malone, who promoted an upcoming anti-vaccine rally. You know what? I don't even want to get into the arguments about what is and isn't right and true about COVID or the vaccine. All I want to ask is, what are these people afraid of? Variety is admitting that this is the most listened to podcast on Spotify. People want to hear Rogan, and Rogan, <laughs> for everything else that he may be, is not a terrorist. He's a nice, derpy guy who talks to people at length and hears what they have to say. He doesn't just have anti-COVID people on. He has Sanjay Gupta on. You know, he has people on. He states his opinion. He listens to them. He talks to them. They answer him and he and his fans either agree or disagree with what is said. What is wrong and threatening about that? unless you have something to hide, right? To look at this rhetoric, more than 260 doctors. How many, how many doctors do you think there are in this country? How many people are there in this country? 260 people are threatened by the fact that some guy, some UFC dude on Spotify has a lot of listeners, right? Implementing a misinformation policy simply means shutting people down. And it, far be it for me to suggest that Joe Rogan is our modern Socrates, but they have this in common. They know that they are not wise and they ask questions and people answer them. And there is nothing more threatening than that to a regime that is afraid of the truth. Socrates said, says himself that it is not as Socrates he is on trial, nor is it as Socrates that he is the wisest man in the world, but that anybody who admits his own ignorance and asks questions in a spirit of openness is himself placing himself in the role of Socrates that is on the side of truth and things don't go well for such people. I want now to remind you of the passage that I read at the very beginning, because this is the answer to your questions that you always ask me, what do I stand for? How can I endure the risks that I incur by standing for my principles? He says, this is the truth of the matter, gentlemen of the jury, wherever a man has taken a position that he believes to be best or has been placed by his commander, there he must, I think, remain and face danger without a thought for death or anything else rather than disgrace. If you quail in the face of 
any accusation, then the thing that you say you believe in is really not in the last analysis, the most important, highest goal for you. It would have been a dreadful way to behave, he goes on, gentlemen of the jury, if at Potidaea, Amphipolis, and Delium, I had at the risk of death like anyone else, if I had remained at my post where those you had elected to command had ordered me, and then when the God ordered me as I thought and believed to live the life of a philosopher, to examine myself and others, I had abandoned my post for fear of death or anything else, that would have been a dreadful thing. And then I might truly have justly been brought here for not believing that there are gods, disobeying the oracle, fearing death, and thinking I was wise when I was not. He's saying, you want to see atheism? You want to see disbelief in the gods? Watch a coward. Cowards show by their actions that they do not in the end believe that the life of this world is less important than the life of the soul. We had Thomas More a while back who said something very, very similar, and this is in, in essence what courage means. To fear death, gentlemen, is no other than to think oneself wise when one is not, to think one knows what one does not know. No one knows whether death may not be the greatest of all blessings for a man, yet men fear it as if they knew that it is the greatest of evils. And surely it is the most blameworthy ignorance to believe that one knows what one does not know. It is perhaps on this point and in this respect, gentlemen, that I differ from the majority of men. And if I were to claim that I am wiser than anyone in anything, it would be in this, that as I have no adequate knowledge of things in the underworld, so I do not think I have. He's saying, I do not know what I do not know. I do know, however, that it is wicked and shameful to do wrong, to disobey one's superior, be he God or man. I shall never fear or avoid things of which I do not know, whether they may not be good rather than things that I know to be bad. Even if you acquitted me now and did not believe Anatus, who said to you that either I should not have been brought here in the first place or that now I am here, you cannot avoid executing me. For if I should be acquitted, your sons would practice the teachings of Socrates and all be thoroughly corrupted. If you said to me in this regard, Socrates, we do not believe Anatus now, we acquit you, but only on condition that you spend no more time on this investigation and do not practice philosophy, and if you are caught doing so, you will die. If, as I say, you were to acquit me on those terms, I would say to you, gentlemen of the jury, I am grateful and I am your friend, but I will obey the God rather than you, as long as I draw breath and am able. I shall not cease to practice philosophy to exhort you in my usual way to point out to any one of you whom I happen to meet. Good sir, you are an Athenian, a citizen of the greatest city with the greatest reputation for both wisdom and power. Are you not ashamed of your eagerness to possess as much wealth, reputation, and honors as possible while you do not care for nor give thought to wisdom or truth or the best possible state of your soul? I will obey the God rather than you. You can say to me whatever you like about the state of pagan souls, but if you believe that Socrates is not tapping in here to the one great spirit and the one great mind that brought Jesus Christ to the cross, you are kidding yourself. Man, this text is really one for <laughs> the ages, not to be cliche about it, but of course it speaks to us today. Of course it's resonant. Of course it's relevant because the things that it is describing are eternal. Truth never has many friends, but those who stand behind it always find that the, that which is with them is greater than that which is against them. Have you ever looked at your credit card bill and just found like a random charge from Netflix or something, even though you haven't watched anything in months, you've probably got a ton of unused subscriptions and Truebill is the place to go to cut them out. On average, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill just for cutting out unwanted subscriptions. That's a hefty chunk of change and it's really simple to do. Companies know that you will forget about them if they can just reel you in with like a free trial or something and then they roll you on to the service and you, before you know it, you're paying through the nose for all sorts of stuff that you're not using or maybe like you once were watching Netflix and now it's gone or you don't care about it anymore or you're boycotting it, uh, but you're still paying the money. Don't fall for subscriptions subscription scams. Start canceling today at truebill.com slash heretics. You go right now to truebill.com slash heretics. You could save thousands a year. One more time, it's truebill.com slash 
heretics. There are incredible testimonials. I myself have saved a bunch of money using Truebill. Other people have saved even more than me. One guy saved 660 bucks for the year on DirecTV, 120 for the year on Sirius XM, 840 a year on car insurance. That stuff adds up. And man, we got to be building the young heretics empire of fabulously wealthy, magnificently jacked, and brilliantly wise philosopher kings. In order to do that, you need Truebill, truebill.com slash heretics. Go check it out. Mailbag questions come to me on Locals. Locals is a platform that I cannot say enough good things about, and the Locals VIPs are a community that I cannot say enough good things about. At youngheretics.com forward slash locals, you can join a select group of people who want more out of the Western canon than they can get in just an hour a week. And so we go deeper into not only, you know, what we talk about on the show, but how to apply the principles and the truths that we talk about in our everyday lives. We have live stream Q&As. I I translate the Bible and comment on it. I write some essays that you can only find on there. And just in general, it's actually a really great support group. We do some prayer together, no matter where you are in your faith journey. You know, we, we sometimes pray together. Um, and it's a really, I find, a wonderful and enriching experience, uh, a way to get a deeper dimension on this show and the stuff we talk about. Um, so please do join us. It's youngheretics.com forward slash locals. I would love to see you there. Here's a question, a mailbag question from Peter. Peter watched the episode where I talked about New Year's resolutions in Plato's Republic Book 4. And I was talking about the, can, uh, the cardinal virtues and how to cultivate them. And here's what Peter asked. He said, I have a question here. Plato starts by asking the question, is justice good for its own sake, removing anything good that might come from it? But in this episode, you, Dr. Clavin, end by talking about how's that working out for you. It seems to me that how's it working out, not being just or being just is itself one of the good things that comes from justice. So it would not be an acceptable source of argument for why justice is good. What is different about these good things coming from justice from the good things that come from justice that were ruled out as sources of why it is good to be just rather than unjust? So Peter is saying, okay, buddy, you started to say that a good measure, a good diagnostic test of virtue and justice is how's your life working out? And you rightly point out that a certain version of that question is exactly the question Plato tells us not to ask, right? At the beginning of the Republic, the whole premise is whether justice is good per se, that is, it's good to be just no matter what sort of bad things might happen to you, um, or whether justice is only good for the rewards that it brings. And that question starts to be answered in book four. And so that's why we were talking about this. And I'm going to answer Peter's question by raising a distinction that Aristotle makes uh, throughout his work, but especially in the Nicomachean Ethics about things that are good because of what they bring to you versus things that are good because of the inherent practice of them. So there are some things that we do to get something else, some reward. Most people go to work to do this, right? To get money. They don't necessarily love the work that they do, uh, although many of us do. I hope that you do. But a lot of people don't, right, love the thing that they're doing at work. It doesn't bring them joy or pleasure. But the thing that they get from it, the wages, right, is is a good because it helps them to live. And that good is intrinsic. It's intrinsically good to live and to flourish, right, and to have health, these sorts of things, which you can, you know, support with the wages that you make at work. That is the kind of good that justice you know, may produce, but that it isn't part of its intrinsic goodness. Then there's a kind of good that comes simply from the the having of the thing, the consummation, you might say, of the thing. C.S. Lewis also talks about this when he says, you can woo a woman, you can court a woman because you want her money, or you can court a woman because you want her. And that's fundamentally different. If you get the thing that the, the process is designed to create, then great. If you're just trying to get some other thing, then it's kind of less noble or less valuable. Working out is also like this, right? People work out to be healthy, but being healthy is just the, the working out, you know, of the sort of the consequence, the natural consequence, you might say, of working out. Then there's an even a better good, which is that the thing itself, doing the thing itself brings you joy, is, is in and of itself good. And justice is that kind of thing. So you're right. How's that working out for you? What I mean by that is not, are you rich? Are you powerful? Are you getting rewards in the world, right? You may be in jail. You may be, as we've just talked about with Socrates, you, you may be up 
on trial for your life. I mean, look at Kyle Rittenhouse and the ordeal that he had to go through um, for doing what I believe was a just and, and good thing, right? Um, the kind of question that I'm trying to ask is how is it working out for you in terms of your soul? Because that's what Plato asks at the end of book four. He says, now that we know what justice is, it's foolish to ask whether it's good inherently or not, because it just is a kind of health of the soul. And health of the soul manifests naturally in certain ways, right? Um, it manifests in terms of, of peacefulness, right? And, and actually, there is another diagnostic test that's in the Bible, which is relevant here, and that's the fruits of the spirit, right? The fruit, nobody can see what's in somebody's soul. Nobody, you can't peer open somebody's chest, pry open somebody's chest and look in and see justice. But you can see the fruits, like like they come out of roots inside, they come out of a tree, right? And those fruits are patience, joy, long-suffering, charity, tenderness, right? These things come from justice as its inherent reward because of what justice is. And so when I say, how's that working out for you? I'm saying things like, you know, are you, are you depressed and listless all the time? Um, are you finding yourself like less and less motivated to get out of bed every day because, you know, you just, you're constantly looking at porn on the internet or whatever, then perhaps that is indicative of a lack of virtue because it suggests a kind of depression of the soul, right? A lack of, um, of, you know, keeping your, your house in order, your internal house, your soul in order. And that's not a condemnation of the kind that we usually think of. You usually think of moral condemnations like that's bad and wrong. It's bad and wrong. You're looking at all that porn, right? But actually, as I've been stressing throughout all of our talks about ethics, right? Both in the Republic and Nick and McKean ethics and all of that, right? As I've been stressing, that's not really what ethics is about. Ethics is about the kind of being that you are and what it is like to be good at being that kind of being. And you're going to get certain rewards out of that. They're not going to be the rewards that the world gives you, like wages, right? You're not going to necessarily get rich or have a hot wife or any of these other things, but you are going to get the wages of justice inherently per se. So you ask a question, Peter, that hits right at this classical distinction, right, between things that you get um, in exchange for something versus things that you get out of the, the thing itself. And the how's that working out for you question is about measuring using the fruits of the spirit, using the sort of I internal sense that you have of, of your own eudaimonia, well-being, flourishing, right? Um, it's about measuring that kind of reward, that inherent reward that you get out of justice as virtue. Hope that answers the question. Um, it's a great question, and I think it clarifies something that is important about both Socrates' death and Republic Book 4. Um, if you want to be able to ask questions like that, you've got to be on Locals, youngheretics.com forward slash Locals. In any case, I will see you next week. It's always a pleasure. If you like this show, you will love the Claremont Institute. It's where I work. We put out The American Mind and the Claremont Review of Books, two excellent publications, in my humble opinion. And you can find my writing there, but also lots of other people's writing. Um, and you can donate to support us at claremont.org forward slash donate, which we would be very grateful for. If you do, please let us know in the notes that you heard about Claremont through Young Heretics. That's it for me. I will see you next time for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters.